All right, let me start with a riddle. What's got two thumbs and has done all three things and that trite meme from N1 Training? This guy. All right, so let's get to part two of training to failure and this idea that it causes disproportionate fatigue. Um, I'll say it again for those who didn't watch part one. Nothing in this is me advocating training to muscular failure. Go back and watch the previous video where I spend endless amounts of time explaining my stance. I'll just keep it simple here to keep it short. Um, so let's get started. Uh, so now I want to look at four specific papers. Three were referenced in the Pelland paper, and then the other one is brand new which is why I seem to be the only one that is even aware of it or you know, mentioning of it. So the first paper I'm going to look at is by Moran Navarro R, Time Course of Recovery Following Resistance Training, Leading or Not to Failure, European Journal of Applied Physiology, 2017, December, blah, 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 blah. All right, so here's what the study did. It took 10 highly resistance trained men, uh, tested their maxes, and then it had them do three different workouts. And all 10 did all three workouts with a four-week break. They either did... 3 by 10 at 75%, so three sets to failure. They did 6 by 5 at the same load, so same volume, but five reps in reserve, half the intensity. Or they did 3 by 5, so half the volume, 50% of the intensity. So they did two exercises, the Smith Machine Bench Press and the Smith Machine Squat, which meant that in each given workout, they did six total sets to failure, three and three, or 12 total sets of five, five reps in reserve, or six total sets of five. Got it? They tested several uh, neuromechan or neuromuscular factors, including counter movement, jump, bench press, and squat velocity. I'm not going to get into the details because they're super boring. They also looked at creatine kinase, and this was measured uh, pre-workout, right at the end of the workout, six hours later, 24 hours, 48 hours, and 72 hours to see what the recovery parameters were from each of the different workouts. Let's look at what they found. So without putting up a million headache-inducing uh, graphic images, the long and the short of it is this. The non-failure groups, it gets super complicated. Like, they didn't generate any fatigue compared to baseline, but there were small differences between 6x5 and 3x5. But in the aggregate, it was pretty much a flat line compared to where they started, and it's kind of noise. The failure group generated a great deal of neuromuscular fatigue, all of which was back to baseline by 48 hours, except for one of the bench press velocity tests that was not fully recovered till 72 hours. So in the aggregate, there's still fatigue at 24 hours, it's recovered by 48, except for one test, which again is no surprise. Three by 10 to failure versus six by five warmups versus three by five warmups, are we surprised? But we might ask, if we agree that some degree of fatigue is necessary to improve fitness, couldn't we just as easily conclude that these 6x5 and 3x5 were ineffective at giving any training stimulus? I'm not saying it was or wasn't, I'm just a thought. So far as creatine kinase, the 3x5, which is the solid black line, showed a small increase that was back to normal uh, by 48 hours. The 6x5, which is the, the large, the, the thick dotted black lines, showed an increase, uh, again, 24 hours, back down by 48 hours. And the uh, 3 by 10 failure, which is the, the tiny dotted line, showed obviously the biggest increase um, that had not returned to normal until the 72 hour mark. So clearly it caused a significantly greater amount of muscle damage. So yeah, no shock, six, three sets of failure generates more muscle damage than six sets of warmups and three sets of warmups. Um, but I would ask people this. There are some in this industry who will argue that muscle damage is part of the growth response. It's probably not, but they argue it. And if so, couldn't we just as easily take the data in this paper and argue that the 3 by 10 to failure generated a better growth response, generate more muscle damage? The 6 by 5 and 3 by 5 generated a small amount. It was statistically significant, but you can't have it both ways, guys. If you think muscle damage is part of growth and you want to chase soreness because you think soreness represents muscle damage, which it really doesn't, then the better interpretation of this would be that the higher volume was a better growth response, which again we could have predicted. 
So of course, three by 10 to failure is a better growth response than any number of sets at five reps in reserve, unless you're on a lot of anabolic steroids, in which case what you do in the gym doesn't matter. So what in the aggregate does this study show that three sets to failure generates more fatigue than six warm-ups and certainly three warm-ups and generates more damage than six warm-ups or three warm-ups and is this a surprise to anyone that hard sets generate more fatigue and more damage than repeat warm-up sets it's not a surprise it's not even interesting but we might ask is it actually relevant to real world training i'll come back to that all right, so the second paper I want to look at is by Parea Blanco F. et al., Time Course of Recovery from Resistance Exercise with Different Set Configurations, Journal of Strength and Conditioning Research, 2020, blah, 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 blah. All right, so this one's kind of interesting as a design. What they did was they took 10 recreationally trained men with two to four years of resistance training experience who were not trained strength athletes. They performed the bench press followed by the squat, and over the span of 20 weeks, they performed 10 different resistance training protocols. Either they did sets of 12 or sets of six, sets of 10 versus sets of five, sets of eight versus sets of four, sets of six versus sets of three, or sets of four versus sets of two. These protocols differed in loading magnitude 70, 75, 80, 85%, and 90% of estimated 1RM. And obviously, and this is where it's interesting, the number of reps in reserve was different for the different protocols. For the 12 versus 6, it was 6 reps in reserve. For the 4 versus 2, it was 2 reps in reserve. Now, one thing I find weird, and maybe they phrased this badly, they said the same number of sets were used in all protocols. And as that reads, I take that to mean they did 3 sets of 12 or 3 sets of 6. So the volume wasn't equated here. And if that is what they did, I find that a little limiting. But regardless, let's soldier on and see what, uh, what they measured and what they found. So just like the previous study, they looked at some neuromuscular parameters such as counter movement, jump, and speed, and velocity, and bench press, and squats. Too boring to try to describe. Uh, and also some blood measurements, including creatine kinase. And they looked at this pre-workout, post-workout, 24 hours, and 48 hours later. They did not look at it beyond that. So let's look at the, what the results were. All right, so this mess of an image shows the, the changes in neuromuscular fatigue. And don't try to read through all the numbers. Let's just focus on like all those little characters that um, come up after, after the numbers, right? Because that indicates there was some statistical significance compared to uh, like right after the workout. And so what you can see is that like pretty much all of them generated some fatigue rub to something immediately after. But by six hours post, um, most everything had gone back to normal except for counter movement jump. You can see next to that, there's pretty much some special character next to all of those numbers. By 24 hours of post, pretty much everything was back to normal except for counter movement jump in the failure sets, right? Those top six numbers under count CMJ. And by 48 hours, everybody was back to normal on everything. So again, no huge surprise, the failure protocols um, cause more acute and slightly longer term fatigue than doing half as many reps. And if I'm reading it right, half as many sets. So looking at creatine kinase, with the exception of the sets of five with an estimated 10 RM, creatine kinase was significantly higher in all groups at 48 hours, but it was reached the highest levels in the sets of failure of uh, sets of 12, 10, and 8. And you can, if you look at that graph kind of left to right, that's what you're seeing. So the higher repetition sets to failure raise creatine kinase the most, but it did go up in all groups. Which isn't any real surprise since we know that the typical hypertrophy zone is higher because of the combination of tension and mechanical fatigue. Now again, this paper seems to have done not only half intensity but half volume if I'm reading it right, and, and um, it's hard for me to, I think that, that makes the comparison a little bit more difficult. Because again, obviously, 3 by 12 is way harder than 3 by 6, which are three warm-up sets. Even 3 by 4 is a lot harder than 3 by 2. It would have been a better comparison if they equated volume. But they didn't. Regardless, yes, going to failure causes more fatigue. It's mostly gone, basically all gone by 48 hours. Then doing half as many repetitions and apparently half as many sets. And the difference is, is bigger the bigger the spread in reps. 
no surprise there. All right, so the third and final paper from the Pelland et al. Uh, review I want to uh, talk about is pause GA et al. Muscle activation and volume load performance of paired resistance training bouts with differing intercession recovery periods, science and sports 2021, blah, blah, blah. This one wasn't actually comparing failure to non-failure. It was looking at recovery after a heavy workout. It took 19 men who were very experienced, 6.7 years average of resistance training. So then the, the workout itself was four sets of 8RM of flat bench, then four sets of 8RM at a 30 degree incline bench, so eight total sets. And, and they did this, so they did that, and they rest 24 hours, and then they did the same workout. And then they took however long, and then they did the same thing. And they did the first workout and rested 48 hours, and then did the second workout. And they did blah, 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 and did it a third time. Did the first workout, 72 hours, and then did it. And I'm sure they did it in random order and all that other stuff. I, I just The way I had it described uh, initially made no sense. It sounded like they were doing working out every three times in a row. It was three different tests across a number of weeks with enough time in between it to recover. So this one did a bunch of service uh, EMG, which I'm not going to bother with because, A, service EMG isn't great and it's just not that interesting. But the main thing they were looking at, or rather a main thing, was the volume load of the workouts for the first compared to the second at 24, 48, or 72 hours. And since this data is easy to show, I'm actually going to show the image um, of exactly what they found. And so what you can see, and they looked at volume load, reps, time sets, time load for each exercise protocol for the session one, session two, um, and just look at the overall session volume load. Uh, at 24 hours, there was a significant drop from the first to the second workout. They were not recovered at the second workout. But by 48 hours, the volume load was not different. By 72 hours, the volume load was not different. So basically, on average, the recovery from eight sets to failure occurred in 48 hours, at least to the bench press. Would it be different for squats? Yeah, maybe, yeah, probably, probably this is what they tested, so that's the data we have. So with those three papers examined, I'd ask the question, especially regarding the first two, which are very representative of the literature uh, in this area. Do they even matter? Does a study comparing three sets of 10 to failure versus six by five at five reps in reserve what amount to warm up sets have anything to do with real world hypertrophy training? Regardless of the results, are they relevant to what we're discussing? The answer is no. Yes, the second paper did a, a varying comparisons ranging from two reps in reserve all the way up to six, but by the time you're doing three sets of four versus three sets of two, that's not a hypertrophy workout. The results are what they are, yes. Training to failure causes more acute and short long-term fatigue compared to effectively no training stimulus at all. The same holds for the creatine kinase data where clearly the failure sets are raising it much, much uh, more than the you know, repeat warm-up sets. Again, if you're working from the standpoint that muscle damage is important for growth and many people in this field still are, well, isn't a lessened creatine kinase response worse from the standpoint of muscle growth? We could just as easily interpret the papers in that direction. But at an even more fundamental level, they're not making comparisons that are even relevant to what's being discussed. If, as I stated, the fitness professionals, including Mike Isertel, Jeff Neppard, Krieger, Schoenfeld, all these guys are recommending that you stay one to three reps in reserve and that that's better than failure, then a, set, a study looking at five reps in reserve or more is not relevant. What we need in terms of looking at the impact of failure versus non-failure training on either acute or long-term fatigue or muscle damage via creatine kinase or whatever biochemical parameter you want to measure is studies comparing rational volumes and rational comparisons, by which I mean sets to failure versus sets within one to four reps in reserve. To my knowledge, there is currently only one that has been done. The final paper I wanna look at is Mangene GT et al. Effect of the Repetitions Reserve Resistance Training Strategy on Bench Press Performance, Perceived Effort in Recovery and Train Men. Journal Training Edition Research 2022. So this is brand spanking new, January 2022, which is probably why nobody, to my knowledge, has, um, has talked about it except for me. And the only reason I know about it is because um, one of the authors, uh, Paul Serafini, is an online buddy of mine, and he sent it to me um, a little while back. And... I want to look at it as the fourth 
paper I'm going to bore you with the details of because it, it speaks to, to the issue um, of, of real world comparisons. So the paper recruited 14 college age men who had resistance training experience greater than three years. The average was 7.6 plus or minus 3.7 years. They were required to meet the USPA class three bench press standards when they had to bench press body weight to 1.4 times body weight, sorry, 1.3 times body weight. And the sample was 1.1 to 1.4. So they weren't super strong, but they were strong and they were trained. The subjects were all given five grams of creatine to standardize intake, which I find really interesting. Um, there were two workout protocols done. This is after 1RM testing and all that, all that typical stuff. And all 14 did both workouts um, with some amount of time in between them as a crossover study. So the two workout protocols were five sets at 80% of 1RM to muscular failure, zero reps in reserve, or four sets at three reps in reserve, followed by a final set at muscular failure. Now, because they provided it, and I think it's interesting, this image is showing the total number of repetitions per set along with the volume load. And I actually believe these subjects did hit failure. Because if you look at the solid black line at the top, they go from 10 reps to about seven and a half to five to four and finished at like three. It's somewhere in that range. And that's the kind of rep drop off you would expect going to failure. Whereas on the non-failure workout, they did six, 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 six. And then the final set, they only got about six to failure because they were tired. And then the same holds for the total work per set. On the failure group, it starts high, drops and drops and drops as the rep count falls. And then for the three reps in reserve group, it stays very stable. And what's interesting, they mentioned the results is that actually both groups got the same total number of repetitions and accumulated the same total workload. They just distributed it differently. So I do actually believe that this protocol did what it set out to do, five sets to failure or four sets to three reps in reserve, and then one set to failure. And you see the same thing if you look at the reported reps in reserve in RPE. The failure group had reps in reserve 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, and an RPE of 10, 10, 10, 10, 10. The... Uh, three reps reserve group started at three, a little bit down, a little bit down, a little bit down, and then dropped to zero on the failure set. And their RPE went from approximately seven up to 10, exactly what you'd expect from Zordos' graph. This also shows you that even at three reps in reserve, you will start to lose reps if you try to maintain the load. So again, the fifth set was deliberately taken to failure. All right. As far as what they measured, uh, they did one measure of uh, neuromuscular function and fatigue and recovery. It's super convoluted, so I'm not going to try to explain it, and as you'll see, it kind of doesn't really matter what they did. They also measured, uh, did some blood work, including creatine kinase. They did this at 24, 48, and 72 hours um, following each workout protocol. So here are the results, and, and what you see is basically that neither workout caused any change in velocity, rate of force development, or impulse at 24 or 48 hours, which suggests that neither workout caused any neuromuscular fatigue, which I think we would all find debatable. And then for some reason, it was slightly increased at 72 hours, which also doesn't make a lot of sense. And what I think this really indicates is that this particular test was not sensitive enough to pick up changes in neuromuscular fatigue, for whatever reason. Uh, I spoke to Paul Serafini privately about it, and he says he wishes in hindsight they had used uh, a different or another method to measure this. Um, so I, I don't really want to draw any conclusions from this. Uh, all we can say is that um, going to failure versus three reps in reserve um, don't generate any differences in the zero amount of fatigue that was generated. Moving on. So far as creatine kinase goes, what you see is that both workouts elevated creatine kinase um, the same amount immediately post. I don't know why it wasn't statistically significant at the 24-hour mark, probably just one of those weird statistical anomalies, and then was still elevated at 48 hours and then dropped back to, uh, to baseline at 72 hours. So basically five sets to failure and four sets of three reps in reserve and one set to failure seem to have generated an identical amount of muscle damage. Now, one thing I do wish the paper had done was not have done that fifth set to failure in the three reps in reserve group because it's possible that that one set um, was enough to equate the damage in creatine kinase response. Paul seems to think that's not the case again privately, but it is a possibility. I, again, in hindsight, wish they had done five sets to failure versus five sets to three reps in reserve and obviously used a more sensitive method of measuring neuromuscular fatigue because that would actually 
be valid what we're talking about. Although there are many training systems and many fitness professionals who will tell you that failure is okay, just save it for the last set of an exercise. Well, that's what they did. They didn't see any difference in muscle damage or creatine kinase compared to five sets to failure. So maybe they're not as different as we think. Where the difference was seen was during the workout. The failure group, much higher RPE across sets. 10, exactly what you'd expect. They lost more reps per set, exactly what you would expect. And the paper does conclude that stopping short of failure may allow you to maintain a better workload and an easier RPE, and I would certainly not disagree with that. This is not even the first study I've seen that found that. There's one in women showing the same thing. Present. Now this needs to be replicated. I want to see another study using a more sensitive measure of neuromuscular function. Maybe comparing all zero reps in reserve to all three reps in reserve, because I think that might tell us more. But this does suggest that maybe there's more to it than that. Maybe failure only causes more fatigue compared to warm-up sets. And maybe when you actually make valid comparisons relative to what we're tr talking about, maybe the differences aren't as profound as a lot of people are making them out to be. And let me say it again. I'm not saying you should train to muscular failure. I'm simply stating that the claim being made that failure causes so much more fatigue is based on a data set of fairly irrelevant studies because the comparisons really have nothing to do with the real world training philosophies that are being advocated. All right, that's enough boring research. Um, I'll probably refer back to it going forwards, but uh, I, that's it for looking at, at detailed papers that nobody, but, but me and two other people care about. I want to switch gears now and, and move into the context, the nuance. And I'm going to start by asking a few questions um, based on the results of these studies. Again, the first two are very representative of the literature as a whole in terms of comparing failure to like very submaximal sets. The third paper just gave us an idea about fatigue in general and recovery. Um, and then that fourth paper gave a, a slightly more, uh, in my opinion, valid comparison to what we're actually talking about in the real world. So I'm gonna end part two of this video by just addressing and asking and answering two questions. And then I'll wrap it up in part three. All right, quick reminder, I am talking only about hypertrophy training here. We're talking about muscle growth. Sports training, performance training is a whole different animal in terms of all of this. Given that guys like Krieger and Mike Isertel, they are focusing on hypertrophy when they regurgitate this data set without nuance, all I'm talking about is muscle growth, okay? Because it would take me another 16 hours to cover performance stuff in, in this context although I might mention it. So we have this data set supposedly where sets to failure generate more neuromuscular fatigue than well, warm-up sets, let's face it. Um, usually measuring things like counter movement jump, various types of measurements, <clears throat> barbell kinetics, speed, etc. And my first question to everybody listening to this is, and, no, genuinely, I'm willing to bet that the majority of you listening to this don't even know what a counter-movement jump is. I might be wrong, but I doubt it. Unless you're really tied into powerlifting or sports performance and bar speed and tendo units and stuff, I doubt you understand, are aware of, or care about things like average concentric velocity, rate of force development, uh, impulse, or, or any of these other metrics that are being measured. And I would further ask, does this have any relevance to hypertrophy training? I don't see a lot of bodybuilders doing counter movement jumps two days after they squat, by which I mean none, or worrying about these things like maximum bar speed and rate of force development, because these are not concepts that are relevant to hypertrophy. Absolutely, sports performance, this is absolutely relevant. And realize that that's what most of these studies are, are being done to examine. If I'm training, I don't know, a sprinter, and they're lifting on Monday and they're doing sprint work on Wednesday, am I going to absolutely care that their neuromuscular system is not fatigued on that Wednesday sprint workout? Absolutely. Are these issues that I take into consideration with my elite female power lifter who I never take to failure in the first place? Absolutely, because we have variations in loading, intensity, speed, because she does speed work. These are relevant to sports. 
we are talking about hypertrophy and bodybuilding. Compared to actual sports, it is simple. The movement patterns, the training, what is done. Your neuromuscular system needs to be recovered to do squat snatches at 95%. It does not need to be recovered to do frickin' barbell curls. You're going and training till you, if you're Mike, get a pump or get tired, whatever the hell that means, or until you've spent enough time trying to hit on people at the gym. And if you're training properly, you're doing enough sets to generate sufficient mechanical tension and metabolic work to turn on protein synthesis. Six to eight sets at one to three reps in reserve. That's hypertrophy training in a nutshell. But none of these neuromuscular tests that these studies are doing to gauge fatigue have any bearing on bodybuilding training whatsoever. Sports training, absolutely. Krieger and Mike and Brad and Eric Helms and all these other people, they're not talking about athletes when they prattle about this. Talking about muscle growth, none of this stuff matters. So again, in, in the studies I looked at, right, like even the, the heaviest and longest duration fatigue, uh, usually rec full recovery was by 48 hours. The longest was 72 on like one test. The same was true for creatine kinase, where even in the, 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 the failure sets, it was always back to normal by uh, after 48 hours. So my question relative to this is the same as the first question. And, sorry, the return of and. By that I mean, don't we have to at least consider training frequency in this discussion for it to have any meaning whatsoever? There are still a great many bodybuilders that train a muscle group once a week. So why does it matter if you generate excessive fatigue to 48 or 72 hours if you're not going to train again for seven days? Why does it matter? Let's say you're going to train a muscle group twice a week. So that's every fourth day, Monday and Thursday. Maybe you're doing an upper-lower split or push-pull legs or chest, shoulders, triceps. It doesn't matter. But each muscle group's getting hit every four days, every 96 hours. Recovery is mostly or done in most cases at 48 hours and always gone by 72 hours. Why does this matter? Let's say you're training a muscle every fifth day. Maybe you're doing an upper-lower split. You're only training three days a week, so it's A, B, A, B, A, B. So now you have uh, 120 hours between workouts. If your recovery is done by day three, why does it matter if there's more fatigue? If you're not training the muscle group till day five, and then again, not until day five. If you're doing something even more complex, let's say Monday is your very heavy workout, Thursday is more of a lighter pump workout, you're doing a heavy light. Even if you're still a little bit fatigued from going to failure on Monday by Thursday, it's a light workout, you're just going to go pump it up. And why does this matter? Why does this, even assuming this data applies, comparing failure to warm up sets, why does it matter? Now you say, what about high-frequency bodybuilding? Well, that's just a current fad. There is exactly zero data to support that approach. Although I looked at that in detail on my website, and that data set has its own problems. I can guarantee you that 99% of top bodybuilders don't train that way. They certainly didn't get big that way. It's just a current fad for people to make YouTube content of. But if you were going to do that, I guess if you're going to train a muscle group three times a week, you might have to worry about this type of thing in terms of generating excessive fatigue. Although, again, the one, the one study, eight sets to failure, they were ready to go again in 48 hours. There's nothing that says you couldn't do that eight sets to failure three times a week. I'd make the point again that if you're a bodybuilder, you probably don't even know what average concentric velocity, impulse, or rate of force development is, and you sure as hell don't care about them. So even if it's down a little bit when you train the same muscle group two days later, you don't know enough to know that that fatigue is even there. So stop worrying about it or making a big deal about it. Then someone will say, but I'm training a muscle group four days a week, which 
whatever, you'd be better off training less and frequently and actually using some intensity, but whatever. At that point, you're usually seeing variations in loading, like fortitude training. You see two heavier days and two pumpier days, and whatever. Yeah, maybe this fatigue is a little bit of an issue, but like I said, y'all don't even know what average concentric velocity is enough to care about it. You're not doing encounter movement jumps. This neuromuscular fatigue, it's not relevant. It's not. It's just something for fitness professionals to prattle about, to sound like they know more than they do. But in the real world, top bodybuilders don't train a muscle group that frequently for the most part. So stop worrying about stupid hypotheticals that you're not doing in the first place. And that's as good a place as any to wrap it up. It's been right just over 30 minutes. I looked at some boring research that none of y'all cared about and then asked a couple of, of the easy questions um, to get started. Next time, I'll just jump again straight into it, ask another question or two, and then really have the, the, the long discussion um, about the factors and the context and the nuance and the variables that seemingly no fitness professional or supposed expert, either they never learned it, they're not aware of it, or they're just choosing to ignore it because it can't fit on the Instagram memes that they have to put up every 17 seconds to maintain engagement, leaving the job to fall to me, which is fine because I love hearing my own voice. See you next time.